My name is Johan Smith. I'm a partner in management consulting with KPMG. I'm also the sector leader for telecoms in Southern Africa. A lot of what I've heard in the last day or so was really around the huge decline in voice revenues. We've heard it today and again on stage, you know, the huge data growth. And that has not really been properly monetized. Or, in fact, revenues for operators has not increased significantly. In fact, it's on a decline still. So huge data growth, but not necessarily turning out in terms of dollar values. Telecom companies are increasingly facing competition from content providers and OTTs like YouTube, WhatsApp, Facebook, and the like. The new ecosystem of delivering high bandwidth content over telco networks has a significant impact on our telecom companies. Given that telcos play a crucial role of providing the backbone network, like Willem was, was mentioning just now, For this ecosystem to thrive, it is essential that they find a way to monetize this revenue. Other sectors like financial services are playing a bigger part also and in increasing the competition in our space. Generally, operators who have adopted digitization or explored other non-traditional revenue streams are faring much better than their counterparts. While most operators still lack the dedicated focus to address the challenges of the future, there is an increased awareness which brings us to the current debate. Should operators focus on being providers of connectivity or digital services? To share more light on this topic and provide some insights, I've got today with me Richard Bell. Richard, if you can come to the stage. Richard is the Chief Executive Officer for East Africa Capital Partners and Vice Chairman of Wananchi Group. And Arno Blonde, Innovation Director for Asia, Middle East and Africa of the Orange Group. Each one. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for, for joining me on stage. Um, and looking forward to an insightful discussion. Richard, if I can start with you. Um, you've been involved with a number of telecom operators and content players, Wananchi being you know, one of those pioneering triple play players in Africa. <coughs> what are your thoughts on the future of triple play services in Africa? So, um, first a small correction. I used to be vice chairman of Wananchi Group. I'm now um, CEO of Kuba, a, a data center, um, carrier neutral data center operator in East Africa, so slightly false pretenses. Um, so, so we've built um, a number of networks. The, the Wenanchi um, triple play network was, we, we've built now something past something like um, uh, 300, 350,000 homes in East Africa. Um, uh, connected quite a large proportion of those um, bandwidth consumption has gone um, through the roof, and, and this afternoon I'll be showing some numbers on that bandwidth consumption. It's taken us about four or five years. Um, costs between $300 and $500 a, a megabit to build a home, and if you're getting 30% of them, the cost of a home is um, $1,000 to $1,500 to connect a, a home on fiber. Um, and, and the number of homes we've done over that period, having deployed an enormous amount of capital, it is really very, very, very small compared to the overall um, market and, and, and market demand. So, so it's very clear that, that fiber to the home is not going to service the, the overall needs of um, broadband and connectivity in, in Africa anytime soon. And we've probably done more in, in, in that in East Africa than, than elsewhere. So um, when we talk about triple play, and really when we're saying triple play, what we're talking about is content, um, voice is content, video is content, it's, it's, it's all about the content. The, the question is, what does that mean for the development of the market? Because we can't wait 20 years um, for fiber to get into all these homes. Um, there's been a lot of challenges rolling out fiber to the home, so, so what's going to fill that gap? And we heard in a panel earlier about um, LTE 
Um, I think there's an enormous opportunity for LTE, but, but we need to start addressing some of the challenges of the, that are facing LTE operators if we're going to see triple play really grow. Um, because, because people are always talking about triple play, people are always talking about um, video on demand and over the top applications um, and all of these good things. But the reality is there's just not enough network infrastructure to deliver those services anytime soon over fixed fiber. Um, and so it has to be on wireless. And so, and, and so that's where the real challenge and opportunity is in the next few years. Good. What, what's, what's been, just a follow-on question from that, what's been the key learnings um, from, from the launch of Triple Play services? So, so how, how have you made this transition, you know, to get a company to, you know, fully transition? Because we're talking about a transformation journey, you know, being from a traditional operator to, you know, a content provider. Um, well, the, the, the biggest revelations are not that surprising. First of all, um, once you get fiber into the home, the, um, so, so as an operator, for the, the, the benchmark that we use for how much um, capacity is the consumer using is um, the overall average kilobits per subscriber over the whole network. So you take the whole network bandwidth, divide it by the number of um, subscribers, and that's the kilobits per subscriber. In, in Europe, the benchmark currently is about 550 to 600 kilobits per subscriber across the whole network. Um, at Wenanshi today, the subscribers are already consuming over 400 kilobits per subscriber, and um, within the next two years, they'll reach European benchmarks. Um, so that means that th th it's not really a revolution, but revelation, but people know what to do with bandwidth if they can get it. Um, and the, the, the challenge is that you can only get that on fiber. And at the moment on LTE, the statistics, not on LTE as a technology, but on, on wireless networks as a whole, the, the bandwidth consumption is tiny by comparison. Um, in fact, Wenanshi, with, with a few hundred thousand fiber to the home subscribers, consumes more bandwidth in East Africa than Safaricom does with tens of millions of wireless data subscribers. Um, and, and that's the real problem, is, is that the, the wireless networks are not delivering the bandwidth, um, and if you can't deliver the bandwidth for whatever reason, whether that's whether that's a pricing model, whether that's lack of frequencies, whether that's lack of infrastructure, um, whether that's frequencies being too expensive, if the wireless networks aren't going to be able to d deliver um, more bandwidth to the consumer, then, then all of these great value-added services in terms of OTT are, are simply not going to get deployed because there's not enough customers to use them because the wireless networks aren't able to deliver. Thanks. I don't know if I can turn to you. Africa has been slower in responding to this digital chain challenge or, you know, relatively slower compared to the rest of the world. And there's more focus desired from operators. How has Orange approached the connectivity versus digital, digital services debate? And associated with that, what successes have you seen from these initiatives to offer more content? You know, your partnership with Deezer, um, Star Africa Portal, maybe you want to touch on that as well. Uh, clearly, what we see at Orange is that, um, at least for Orange, uh, we don't consider we are a pipe. Uh, we consider we are a digital service provider. And from the beginning, we have looked at uh, uh, appealing to our customer the best services that they can have with the best, the best device. So I would say that digital has started for Orange for a while with uh, SMS, USSD services, but also IVR. Uh, success of RBT is already content. So I don't think that uh, we, we, we find digital market for the first time. Uh, it's something we know for quite a while and that uh, we, f we follow a lot to have this uh, best customer experience for our customer. So this is our target. It's not only a, a revenue driver, it's not only a, a changing world, it's really to enhance our customers, the best customer experience that they can have. And regarding uh, the experience that we have already in, uh, in digital, so in, in more digital, yes, we, have, we are a, a triple play operator in, in a few countries, uh, but also the market is booming on 
mobile. So as we said this morning, uh, data will be mobile. Uh, and the, the market figures show that clearly mobile um, will, be, will use more and more data. And more and more data means more and more content. Um, I would say that uh, with 2G, you had uh, messaging services. With 3G, you have uh, starting of content, music, uh, image. And with 4G, you have video. So of course, video uh, is a new step forward in terms of new content and new uh, services. Thanks, Arno. Tell me a little bit more about you know, the success. So, so you know, we're talking about monetizing data. Have, have you seen it turn into rand val dollar value for you? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Um, what, we, what we don't want is, uh, and even it's, it's quite amazing that um, our customers use more and more data and more and more uh, content. And sometimes uh, they, they switch from voice to data. So uh, they use more and more data. Uh, more and more content, and of course, uh, it's a key success for for us uh, to give them the best content. I remember. Let me remember you that we are, uh, for example, partner in the uh, African Cup of Nations, and uh, uh, we have a, a nice service which is Orange Football Club, uh, which is worldwide uh, distributed, where we give uh, um, best content on football. And this is a great success in, uh, in Africa, for example. Thanks. Maybe a question that I can, can pose to both of you, and, and this is around the success story that we've seen with Safaricom in East Africa. And I think you know, that, that, that one is, you know, comes top of mind in the African continent, you know, what Safaricom has done with, with M-Pesa. Have you seen operators been able to diversify into other revenue streams to the extent of an MPSA. Um, what, what other revenue streams should operators consider in the future to remain successful and competitive in this market? And why do you think there's not a, a similar story to an MPSA story? Maybe a question, let's, let's start with you, Arno. So first, I, I consider and we consider that uh, we have success story in uh, financial services in, in many countries where we uh, operate. So uh, there is not only M-Pesa uh, in Africa, and I hope True. the financial service happen also in many other countries in, uh, in this continent. It should happen, and it, it happens clearly, uh, and we see it. Um, then it's a good example for us, financial service, because it's a, it's a market shift. Uh, we were used to distribute some uh, SIM cards and, uh, and top up, and now we distribute some money. Uh, so yes, we change uh, our uh, way of working, we change our customer facing, we change our uh, capabilities, and this is a, a real uh, shift in, in our organizations to drive uh, more usage and more uh, digital service, because financial service is a very good example of digital service. Now, there is not only digital uh, financial service. We, we see that uh, there are lots of potentials in, uh, in cloud service uh, that we discussed before. Uh, there are many uh, opportunities in uh, TV, in uh, video. Uh, uh, video on demand can be a, a great opportunity on, so, uh, on this market. And we consider also that uh, there are many other possibilities. Uh, you can do many things with whatever app, and mobile operators need to be in this market. Yeah. Richard, to you. You know, no conference is complete without a discussion on M-Pesa. Um, <laughs> and, and truly, it is a phenomenon. Um, it, it is a, it has driven a huge amount of change in East Africa. Um, I. Uh, you know, I use M-Pesa, I have my phone connected to my bank account, I, I use my phone um, to send people money. If I don't have enough money on my phone, I go to my bank account, get some money, put it on my phone, send it to somebody. Um, it's, it's a mobile ATM machine, it's fantastic. Yeah. I do um, the same with uh, Orange Cash. Well, but, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, what, what people sometimes forget, the, and, and the reason why M-Pesa, um, one of the reasons why M-Pesa became such a phenomenon 
is that, is that mobile money is, is essentially money, right? And, and the principle of money is that um, if, if I'm going to be able to use this type of money, I have to know that you're going to accept this type of money. And, and, and that basic equation is, is, is fundamental. So when, so when Safaricom launched M-Pesa, they had an 82% market share. Um, people like me who had two or three phones, um, they probably had a 90% market share. And, and so at launching that service, it, you could almost guarantee that, that my M-Pesa form of money would be accepted by you because you almost certainly had a Safaricom phone. Um, and, and, and therefore it, it took off and, and all the other things around it happened. Other markets have found that more difficult um, and, it's take, and it's been a much slower journey um, and, and, and the process has been much more tortuous. And the reason has been that in those other markets, um, uh, one operator had 40% share, the other operator had 30% share, the other operator had 20% share. Now, now there's only a 40% chance that you're going to accept my form of money. Um, and, and, and so it doesn't really work because, because I don't know whether you're going to accept my money or not. And, and so one of the, one of the crucial elements of, of um, evolving the, the whole M-Pesa story is, is that regulators have to force interconnection of of, of mobile money, so that, so that your orange flavor of money and my Airtel flavor of money and his Safaricom flavor of money are, are all actually money that everybody will accept. So, so when you talk about evolution of operators and what next for operators, um, the, the even more fascinating story than M-Pesa in Kenya today is, is M-Pesa an equity bank. Um, and, and if you go to any global conference, the, the poster childs of East Africa are the success of Safaricom and the, the success of Equity Bank in the banking space. So, so about um, two years ago, um, Equity Bank were trying to roll out their, their mobile money um, system in Kenya, and, and Safaricom basically priced the services on their network at a point where Equity Bank couldn't roll out their services. They couldn't make any penetration against um, Safaricom's M Pesa. So what did Equity Bank do? Um, well, James Wangi, who's a visionary, said, well, if I can't use somebody else's network, I'll, I'll build my own. And he did a deal to get an MVNO mobile license with um, Airtel um, and, and, and rolled out his services on Airtel um, and started trying to deliver services using a thin SIM. There was then a huge battle about technology. It had nothing to do with technology. It was a, it was a com competition battle because now um, equity bank was becoming a carrier. Um, so more recently, you will have seen that um, uh, actually um, a, a private equity fund has bought Telcom Kenya from, from Orange. Um, and, and, and that same private equity fund is a major shareholder in, in equity bank. Um, and, and it won't shock you, um, or it shouldn't shock you if you find in six months' time that equity bank has an even stronger presence in in, in, in the communication worlds, once it starts integrating its services with, with that mobile phone platform, which, which, they, which they're going to have access to from Orange. And so what happens next? Well, wouldn't surprise me if in a year Safaricom don't say, well, you know what? If a bank can become an operator, why shouldn't this operator become a bank? Um, and they go out and buy a small bank, and they'll overnight be the largest bank in, in East Africa. So, so the, the story about what next for carriers is actually going to be a lot more complicated than simply talking about a value-added service here or a value-added service there. When, when we look at the, the, um, the, the mobile phone industry, what mobile phone operators realize is they're not um, competing um, against other mobile phone operators for cash. They're competing against beer and against Coca-Cola for, for more money out of the consumer's wallet. Um, and I think you're going to see the same sort of evolution with, with carriers that they're going to have to really think hard um, way, way beyond simply a few value-added services to develop new revenue streams in the future. Thanks, Richard. Very insightful. I think my next question follow, you know, almost, almost touches on what you've just mentioned about you know, buying a bank or starting a new bank or whatever. So operators can either build their own content platforms, um, partner with content providers or acquire. Um, which, which model, Arno, let's start with you, which model of, you know, which of these models have you seen work best for Africa? Um, and what is your take on how operators approach their partners, partnerships with, with content providers? I think we, we tried many, uh, 
many different uh, possibilities. And our vision now is, uh, is quite clear. Um, mobile operators have three assets. Uh, first is network, second is billing, so we talk about payment, but uh, uh, car billing is also uh, very important. And last is uh, customer facing, so all about uh, retail distribution uh, channel. So these three assets are very important, whatever the topic and whatever the content. So for uh, any uh, data provider, for any content provider, our assets have value and we are very keen to uh, share this value and uh, to share uh, their value uh, with us. So we are very uh, keen to do partnership, uh, to open uh, our capabilities. We open today uh, SMS APIs, USSD APIs, billing APIs, and this should open clearly the market for any partnership and any content provider to work better uh, and have best services for our Orange customers. This is clearly the topic. So, so clearly you, you're saying a, the partnership model is clearly working for you and you think that yes. is best suited to the African yes. continent? Yes, we are focused on our three assets, network, billing, customer facing, and we want to provide the best customer experience with the best services with the widest people uh, and partnership. So this is clearly and through our those target. partnerships you learn and maybe want to start something on your own. Some subject can be on our own, but uh, I think we all have uh, uh, growth is still very high in the coming years uh, for all of us. Uh, so we we all have a part to to be done, and we are very happy that some people invest producing content and that we support for distribution. We, w the lack, uh, we, sti we still see that the market is changing from, to from SMS to data and content. We still need local content, local production of content. So this has changed, for example, in music. This still needs to be changed in video, in, uh, in, uh, in TV. So the more local content uh, that will be, the better it will be for the continent. And we really want to support this, uh, this uh, subject. Richard, your perspective. Yeah, you know that the, the challenge with operators and content is, is always there's, a, there's an implicit conflict. Um, if, if, if an operator says, my strategic plan is to develop a lot of content, then, um, then that's at conflict with other content which is not operator content. And, and, and so the, the temptation is to give preferential access to content, um, to um, bundle content, and, and, and ultimately that's bad for the market. Um, and, and so, um, personally, I think there's a huge amount of um, work still to be done in rolling out infrastructure. Um, the, the, the cliche is always, oh, we don't want to be a dumb pipe. Um, but you know what? There's an awful lot of dumb pipes to be built before we run out of space for dumb pipes. Um, and, and, and so operators need to focus on building those, the, those pipes and that infrastructure and delivering the bandwidth, and then let content ride over that bandwidth. Um, and, and that's why we're moving from, from, from away from having built infrastructure um, to now building uh, carrier-neutral data centers to service that content over those networks. My next question is, and I referred to it a little bit earlier on. You know what? You know how how do you get into the? How do you change? You know, uh, how do you get into the change of minds of people? You know, so changing an operator is not an easy task. You know, if you've been focusing for quite some time, you know, on building the pipe, you know, getting into content is is, is something new for an operator. Who 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 do you think in that context is going to be the most successful, if you think about you know some of the challenges you're facing, in 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 really you know in in that transformation journey, w what what will be the key differentiating factor, Arno? Um, I would say that um, transformation is in our uh, everyday uh, subject. Uh, Africa is uh, is transforming 
is telco market uh, since many years and transforming very, very quickly. We, uh, as a European uh, operator, we see that uh, Africa is moving much quicker than, uh, than uh, European or American operators because the customer move quicker and change their habits. So we are driven by the customer. The customers uh, 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 make us uh, move quicker, and clearly uh, it changes the organization, it changes the way we work. We, for example, at Orange, we work more and more with uh, mutualized infrastructure so that we share uh, infrastructure uh, between different countries. Uh, we change the way we distribute, and uh, we distribute uh, more and more on a um, uh, digital way. Um, but customers, what is more important is that customers are changing their way of, of uh, living. Uh, the mobile is becoming more and more a, a remote control of their life, of everything. And, uh, and the content is, uh, is naturally uh, moving up in their mind and in their ways to, to live. Yeah, you know, c content is complicated. Um, and, and we know this because at Zuku, we, um, we built uh, actually 11 linear channels under the Zuku brand where we aggregated and played out 11 channels. We then bought another 125 channels on the fiber network. There were nearly 140 channels um, going over that fiber network um, with all sorts of content, but no football. Um, why? because DSTV um, and MultiChoice have tied up all the football rights in a very monopolistic way, um, cross-subsidizing across markets, um, prohibiting other people from getting the content, and, and the regulators have done nothing about it. And, and this has been going on for several years now, um, and, and it still hasn't changed. Um, and, and to give you an example of, of just how bad it is, um, DSTV do not have an over-the-top um, IP product. And yet, in every market that they're present across the entire continent, in fact, even in markets they're not pres present across the entire continent, they have purchased from the content owners the IP rights. So they just buy the IP rights using their market power, warehouse all the content, and it's not available on the internet. Now, um, my kids still get it because they go to I don't know where to get it <laughs> um, over the internet, but 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 it's 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 you can't roll out that content over the internet. So so content is 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 really complicated. It's an entire different ecosystem. Um, that that content's going to become even more complicated um, as as we see content start to to localize. And um, uh, we we heard earlier about um, you know the 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 the, the um, cloud services view of Microsoft and and what happens, and when does it localize, and, and how does that content localize? Well, the, the, the next debate that's going to come around content is, is about data sovereignty, um, because it's, a, it's an equally complex ecosystem. And, and to, the, to the politicians, data sovereignty means um, you know, South African content must stay in South Africa. Um, to the content companies, data sovereignty means, you know what, we can't move our content to South Africa until such time as the um, uh, data protection laws and data privacy laws are at least of the same standard or caliber as anywhere else in the world. And, and, and that's not specific to South Africa, that's specific to all of these markets which haven't really had to grapple with these issues before. Um, so the whole opening up of content and seeing more content, f for me the punchline is we need more bigger dumb pipes um, and then we need to address some of these regulatory issues around access to content, distribution of that content, monetization of that content. Thank you. One last word I would like to say that um, content is not only uh, entertainment in Africa. Uh, the first content is useful content. And clearly w what we see is that uh, people don't use data or any content only for fun. Yes, we need fun and it's nice to have fun. But uh, in Africa, and mainly in Africa, we see that this data and this content is very useful. It can save life. It's important in education. It's important in uh, everyday uh, job 
of, uh, of people. So uh, what we are doing is not only entertainment, uh, it's good to have, but also uh, very key for everybody's life. And uh, this content is changing lives in many uh, hands of African people. Thank you. I see we've run out of time, but maybe just the last question. What does the future look like for Orange? We used to say that future is bright with Orange, so uh, let's continue to, to look at that. Uh, yes, it is very bright. Uh, future in, uh, in Africa is, uh, is really uh, important for Orange, and, um, and we want to do uh, always more and more with our customers and uh, let them happy. Richard, maybe I can change the question a little bit to you. What, what do you see the next disruption in this digital ecosystem to be? The next disruption? Um, and if I put you on the spot, you, you don't need to answer, but <laughs> you seem like somebody that can handle that sort of question. I, we, we'll be talking this afternoon about um, some of the undersea cables, and, and you've seen a lot of the stuff on undersea cables, and, and a lot of talk about undersea cables. What's, what's less known is that um, the total consumption on those ever-increasing number of undersea cables is in the low teens of percent. In, in other words, we haven't even hit 20% um, utilization of those cables. So, so my money says the next big disruption is going to be um, the, the, the operators or, or, or somebody who comes and disrupts the operators saying, you know what, this, this throttling of bandwidth um, is actually a market opportunity, open the pipe. And, and those that open those pipes deliver more capacity um, are going to really um, upset the market. Thanks for that. So thanks, thanks Richard, thanks Arno for the, for the insights you've um, provided. I'm sure you know, some of our operators have, out there have, have learned something from this panel um, today. Um, thanks to we the hope. audience for your presence and, and support. I think um, we're breaking now and the next session starts at 12 o'clock. So you're welcome to have coffee in the exhibition center. Thank you. Thank you.